it is six o'clock. We'll get started. I'll introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Mortensen. I am a commissioner on uh, with the, the city of Tacoma for the city of <laughs> for the city of Tacoma. also a board member with Historic Tacoma, the co-host uh, for this event with the city, along with the Tacoma, Tacoma Historical Society. Um, and then we also have support from Tacoma Creates as well. So um, welcome. I'll go ahead and let my co-host introduce himself also. Uh, hello, I'm my Ross. name is Ross Griffith and um, I'm here representing Historic Tacoma as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll let our, our presenters uh, introduce themselves uh, when, when they begin. Uh, but this is the Virtual Heritage Cafe uh, with Earthwise and Second Use. So you're in the, if that's where you meant to be, you're in the right place. So um, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Amanda uh, Harriman from Second Use, who's gonna be our first presenter this evening. Hey, um... Thank you very much to the City of Tacoma Historic Preservation Office, Tacoma Historic Society, and Historic Tacoma, as well as Tacoma Creates for inviting us. Uh, we're very excited to be um, a part of this talk. Um, I wanted to give everybody a little bit of background information on second use for those who don't know us. Um, we started in 1994 uh, in a gravel lot in Woodenville, um, and our first Seattle location was opened in 1997, and that was in South Park. Our current Seattle store is in Soto, and um, our Tacoma location opened in 2017, which we are very excited to have. So I wanna talk a little bit about the advantages of salvage and deconstruction uh, and talk about the differences between that and demolition. Uh, salvage is going in and taking out uh, materials that is available, easy for reuse, um, sometimes called skims. Deconstruction is taking a house apart entirely piece by piece so that everything that is possible can be reused. And demolition is what we commonly see when you have a bulldozer or a wrecking ball, that kind of thing, go in and just crunch everything down and make it uh, ill usable, not for use. Um, so why do we do salvage de deconstruction? Uh, we do salvage. Uh, Earthwise, I believe you just do salvage as well rather than the full deconstruction. There are groups in the area that will do that, which is wonderful. Um, so it is good for waste reduction, which is pretty obvious. It keeps materials out of the landfill by reusing those materials instead. Um, it's good for sustainability because furthering the use of already processed materials means that we're not using new energy to extract those raw materials again and make them into new goods. Um, it also helps with public health and equity, public health, because uh, the deconstruction process ensures that proper abatement happens, as well as um, um, just being better for air quality, ground quality, water quality, all of that good stuff. Uh, and for equity, um, having those reused materials are typically cheaper than um, new materials, so it allows for more people to participate in um, home repair and remodeling. But today we wanna to talk about how it interacts with historic and cultural preservation, which wasn't always considered a good fit, but salvage is historic preservation. And why is it historic preservation? I'll read this quote from Allison Arlotta, who wrote a master's thesis on it. Um, there is potential in the relationship between preservationists who seek to maintain and restore Oh no, part of my screen is covered. Uh, relevant or reconstruct buildings and sites and waste managers who seek to prevent the extraction of various materials by reducing consumption, reusing materials and recycling elements. Um, sorry, I'm not able to see my full screen here. I'm trying to get that away. Oh well. So I apologize for, <laughs> for not being able to see my entire quote. <laughs> and then this great quote um, for, that comes from the city of San Antonio Office of Historic Preservation. Uh, I saw a talk by Stephanie Phillips that like an organ donor, a building may have reached the end of its life, but its salvaged materials can live on in dozens of other historic structures. 
Um, and she further talked about the fact that uh, it is, which San Antonio has a big eye on um, disaster preparedness. And so having these materials ready to go, they see as a element of disaster, preser uh, disaster preparedness, which we should be thinking about in our area too, even though our disasters aren't yearly, um, we know it's gonna happen eventually. So historic preservation is also waste prevention because uh, by saving these buildings that um, all of the groups work to do uh, means that those things are not going to waste because they're being used, which is wonderful. So we wanna talk about a few of the jobs that we have done very recently. Um, the first one being Pacific Lanes Bowling Center. These are all focused in the Tacoma area. Uh, Pacific Lanes Bowling Center was open for around 50 years in South Tacoma, just off Pacific. They closed, unfortunately, in May 2019. Um, we did get to go in there and get a bunch of materials before it was demolished, but the building itself was demolished in the end, and I believe there's an apartment building standing there now. Um, so, um, the, we took a bunch of other materials, the seats, some of the pins and all that kind of thing, but really the reason why we're there is for the bowling lane, um, which bowling lanes are kind of an interesting thing. Um, they are built in the building themselves rather than brought in pre-built, uh, wood bowling lanes that is. Um, and they are put together on site in their stack together like a wall. So if you put down your first piece of wood, you put down a layer of glue, you put down your second layer of wood, and then you nail them together. And then you put down glue, wood, nails, glue, wood, nails, and they build it vertically like a wall. And then it is laid down. Um, and it is all very controlled. The USBC placed a rule in 1939 that lanes must only have 40 one thousandth of an inch difference in the level of the lane surface to ensure that all bowling lanes roll as similar as possible. Um, so it's very, very precise. And uh, they also made the rule so precise to make sure that craftsmen were putting these together as well as keeping, um, keeping them um, uh, up to par. Um, and so imposter, what they called imposter resurfacers cannot come in and do that. Um, so they were built very thick because they do need to be kept up and made sure that they are level. Um, so people love bowling lane for reuse. Uh, so when you're going in to take these back out, um, I'm sorry, not for reuse, they're gonna be used for repurpose, something different. Uh, people like to repurpose the bowling lane because they are built by craftsmen and they're very thick, uh, nice wood. Um, so when you're going in, you have to plan ahead. Um, we planned out where we wanted to make all the cuts to get all the usable pieces. Um, there is maple uh, wood in the approach of each lane, which is the harder wood, because that's where the ball is gonna hit. And then the rest of the lane is made out of pine. Um, and so we did, made strategic plan about where to cut and you go through and make relief cuts um, everywhere so they know where to go. But since it's very thick, a, um, a circular saw isn't gonna work. So we had to cut them all apart with sawzall blades and um, saws, which I understand we went through a ton of blades on this project at Pacific Lanes. Um, so once you get it all cut apart, you have to lift it up onto lumber carts, make sure you have uh, enough crew to do that. And it's also important that you start back at the pins so you have something to roll your lumber cart back on. And there's the crew putting those heavy pieces of lane onto our lumber cart to take out to our truck. Um, and we got a lot of bowling. There's 36 lanes at Pacific Lanes. Uh, so we still have some of this material available at our Tacoma and Seattle stores. This picture was taken at our Tacoma store. Beautiful piece of lane. Um, and as I said, people use this for repurpose. So it's never gonna go back into a bowling lane. But bowling fans are people who just like um, the look and the quality will use it in lots of applications. And here our customer Liz has used it to make an island countertop. Um, she used to live in historic homes and when she moved to the Northwest, she bought a new construction and she really missed having 
um, the history in her house. And so she's trying to find ways to fit the history in. And I know she shops at Earthwise and she shops at Second Use. And this is her beautiful kitchen island. She has a great Instagram feed, particularly if you guys like chickens, Blackberry Hill Farm, Washington. She lives out in King County and has a great farm full of reuse and repurposed items. So that was specific lanes. Next, we have an adorable little home uh, built in 1929 in the Proctor District. It was on North 29th Street. It is no longer there, but that is what it has looked like. Uh, we um, took a lot of doors and a lot of windows from this house. The little arched window above that main window there. Uh, uh, yeah, the little window above the main one came and it was a uh, very cute leaded window. Um, this was the kitchen in the house. Uh, it was remodeled in the 60s at some point, but we could tell that these were the original uh, custom built cabinets for this kitchen in the late 20s, uh, which often are difficult to get out and remain reusable, but we were able to do it. And so you can see there are all those cabinets that were in our store. This material has all since sold and we unfortunately did not get any photos of it in its new home. Uh, I would love to see where this ended up. It was absolutely adorable um, and great built stuff. This is on the other side of the kitchen. You can see a little hutch there. The mirror had these gorgeous japanned um, cabinet handles. There it is in the Tacoma store. And looking through the other kitchen, you can see the little um, spice cupboard on the wall back there. We got that, a real true cupboard. And we also found some of the extra ship lap siding uh, in the attic and it was marked with the clear fur lumber co mark. Uh, from what I discovered, the clear fur lumber co uh, was on Day Island and burnt down in the 1930s. Um, but yeah, great for ship lap siding. I think we saw um, some other Tacoma stamps on a lot of the wood that came out of that house. So it was uh, truly local materials that got to stay uh, locally, which is uh, really nice. Uh, next we have, uh, it's come my favorite, the Union Club Hall. Uh, it was originally built in 1888 and finished in 1890. And likely most of you know, it was protected as a historic place uh, due to the, all the work of some of the fine folks here tonight. Um, it was built as a social club and its membership roster reads like a who's who of Tacoma and Pacific Northwest history. Um, it is now a co-working and event space um, owned and operated by Surge Tacoma and they have a passion for historic preservation. So that's great. Nobody went in there to take apart or dismantle this building and that is wonderful to hear. Um, however, Surge had some items they just couldn't find a use for they still wanted them to be saved and so they gave us a call. Uh, so I want to just highlight one item from that job. It is the original, um, I don't know if it's the original, but it is a membership board from the University Union Club. Um, beautiful, stylish oak um, member board. And if you look closely at that, you can see that it truly is uh, a who's who of um, Historic Tacoma and the Pacific Northwest. There's a lot of fun names in there. And this item is also, last I checked, still available. I meant to go in and look today, but um, as far as I know, it's still at our Tacoma store. And the last little job I wanna talk about um, is Lincoln Hardware. It was in the in business from the 1930s until 2020, uh, owned and operated at the location here since 1946 by three generations of the Feist family. Um, Julius uh, Feist was the one who bought it in 1946 and uh, it was closed by his grandchildren, Scott, Dave and Jennifer when they decided it was time to retire. Um, so it was great, they got to retire on their own terms. They weren't forced out and as far as I believe I've read, this building is going to remain standing and a catering company was going to be coming in and using it next. Um, but it was a true neighborhood gathering spot with many loyal customers, including the neighborhood's local historian, Kim Davenport, 
Um, it was full of these wonderful custom built displays. If you can see that one in the front that's covered in gardening stuff, um, this is what Lincoln Hardware called us about was their custom displays and what we got. So there's that front little display. Here it is in our store. And we got all of these um, really nice, as I said, custom built displays. There's another one available that was for sale. We still have lots of these displays available. But what our uh, crew in Tacoma was really excited about was being able to use some of these displays and have that history of Lincoln Hardware live on in our store. So we are using as many as possible, um, but there were a lot. So um, we were selling the rest that we couldn't use. And that is the last job I have to talk about. Thank you so much for having us. Um, we wanna say how truly grateful we are to be connecting with you all. Um, thank you, Lauren, for reaching out to us. We wanna continue to have a dialogue with the historic um, preservation groups uh, and enthusiasts in the future, because we think it's an important part of what we do. And I'm very excited to hear about the projects. I know Aaron has a very cool project that he's going to be talking to you about. Hey, thank you, Amanda and Aaron. I think you're pretty well queued up as well. So um, we do have a question popped up, but we'll wait till the end for questions, but feel free to keep putting questions in Q&A or the Facebook um, comments. And we'll get to questions after Aaron's presentation. All right, hi everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here. I'm going to attempt to share my screen with you. And I just have to warn you that I am not super savvy with Zoom, so bear with me, please. Okay, we're gonna go to the top. All right, can everyone see that? I, I can't tell if you can, so I'm just gonna assume you guys can. That looks All right. great. Uh, cool, thanks. Uh, I'm Aaron, uh, Aaron Blanchard from Earthwise Architectural Salvage. I'm the Director of Operations there. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about adaptive reuse, um, as well as just some projects that we've worked on. Uh, just a little bit of a history on Earthwise. Um, we were founded in 1991 by the guy you see in the second picture here, who I definitely did not think was going to be on this call, but texted me and said he's going to be on this call. Uh, that is Kurt. Um, uh, founded in 1991. Fun fact about that, uh, Kurt and Roy, whose last name is escaping me, actually founded Earthwise together, and then several years they went uh, separate directions uh, amicably, and Roy opened up Second Use. So we actually have very shared roots together. Um, I started out at our Tacoma location, and um, the second project that I'm going to talk about today was actually kind of the one that uh, kind of just got me absolutely obsessed with salvage and has led me to where I am today, just doing living this, uh, this kind of salvage lifestyle. Um, so just a few things about the pictures you see in front of you right now. Uh, the left one there is a really beautiful, this is stained glass out of a 1920s church. Um, interesting about those, that style of stained glass, you might notice that it looks almost like it's painted and that's because it is actually hand painted and glazed and then fired in a kiln like you would for a clay pot or something like that before it's installed. So it's a very high quality of glass. This was University Christian Church. And actually, we started its sister church, which is about two blocks south of it, almost an entire city block, University Temple, um, the same architect and the same glass designer. Uh, and it's, so we have a lot of experience with this kind of stuff. And we just, you know, we're just so glad that people have brought us in to keep the cool building materials from these churches out of the landfill. Uh, that's Kurt himself. This was a really cool um, Capitol Hill mansion. That's some quarter sawn oak paneling he's removing there. This is uh, this is a not my style, but you know it's, it's good for some people. But a very gaudy crystal chandelier from the Escala Building in Seattle. And some of you diehard Fifty Shades of Grey fans may know that is the Fifty Shades of Grey building. This was actually the apartment, the suite from that uh, book made into a movie later. So we uh, stripped out that whole place and it was a very interesting project. Uh, fun fact there, there are about 50 windows in there and there are 50 shades on those windows. And guess what color they are? Gray. There are 50 shades of gray in the 50 shades of gray apartment. Fun fact. 
This is a cool doorknob that requires no further explanation. It's just a nice doorknob. So um, getting into the adaptive reuse thing, I want to start with a little bit of kind of the standard operating procedure uh, for development. Let's say you acquire a piece of property and you either want to, you, you don't like the way it is, you want to change it. Standard operating procedure is to demolish the old building and to put a new building in. And that kind of, it seems a little innocuous, but when you really think about it, it is a total one-two punch to the environment. First off, you are taking an old building that is full of old materials, old growth lumber, all of the foundation, the joists, the beams, the walls, the foundation, everything, and throwing that in the landfill. Uh, these are materials that you can't really find these days because we've uh, logged most of the old growth forests in this country. And then add to that the supply chains and all the materials that come with new construction. Um, you know, you just have to think of how many things that end up in our new construction actually are shipped from China. So not only the, you know, falling of all the trees to create the framing, the, you know, just even all the way down to the little plastic switch plates that have to travel all the way from China. So they have to make these switch plates and then they have to burn a ton of fossil fuels to get them to your job site. It's really not a sustainable way to do things. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of an out to some projects here because there's one situation where you really, I, I understand the, that is as nice as it would be to save it. Um, it's, it's sometimes cost prohibitive when it gets to seismic retrofitting. Many of you may recognize this. This is a uh, Holy Rosary church. Honestly, it's like about a football field that way from me. It's uh, right next door to me and it has been slated for demolition. Very sadly, uh, a huge chunk of the roof fell into the sanctuary um, thankfully didn't land on anyone but they closed it down a couple of years ago have done a lot spent a lot of money assessing you know what is wrong with it it's going to be 18 million dollars to do all the work they need to do to make this safe in the event of an earthquake and as much as I love this building, I mean, it is part of my neighborhood. I love it so much. I, I can also think of a lot of other good things that $18 million could go towards. So I guess when you think of, when you feel sad about a building being demolished, it's worth recognizing that the investment that it might take to save it, even though that kind of stings sometimes. So when we, um, when we go into a building, I want to talk a little bit about the incentives that take place. So the incentives of a building, I mean, if we're being called in, it's because it's going to be remodeled or demolished. Our incentive, because we don't actually charge anything for our services, our, our crews go in completely for free and do all this removal. We make all of our money by selling the materials that we salvage. So our incentive when we go into a building is not to take every single stick of framing and the foundation and everything. It is to get the reusable stuff, the doors, the windows, the cabinets, things that people can put in their homes. And as sad as it is, it's really hard uh, for me to send my crew in to spend a couple hours, you know, pulling all the lath and plaster off of a wall so that we can expose the two by four so that we can take it out and sell it for like a few dollars. It, it's unfortunate, but that's the reality that that is just absolutely cost prohibitive. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we're the last people in these buildings before they get demolished. I'm walking away from it thinking, gosh, I'm leaving an entire building here. The roof is there, the walls, the siding, the foundation, all of the joists, drywall, you name it. It all ends up usually going to the landfill. So then you take a look at the incentives of the demolition contractor. Oftentimes these people are kind of painted as the bad guys and I, I totally get that because they're the ones actually doing the work, um, but it's also worth realizing how their process works. Uh, usually when a building is being demolished, people seek multiple bids, like, like any kind of a project you do. You get a bunch of different demo contractors to bid on the project, and typically you choose the cheapest option because you're trying to make a project work. And so the incentive for this demo contractor is to crunch the building into the smallest pieces possible, as quickly as possible, get it into as few dumpsters as possible, and get it off site so they can move on to the next project. And it kind of breaks my heart, but that is really, you know, there's not an incentive um, to save the things that you see in this picture. Um, these are actually the beams out of the Aberdeen Armory. 
Um, we have a store in Aberdeen, Tacoma, and Seattle, and the Aberdeen has been a really interesting one um, because we come across things like this. Uh, you may know if you've driven through there, they were at one point the lumber capital of the world. So um, fortunately, with this situation, um, a big shout out to Roglin's Demolition, who was able to uh, remove these beams in incredibly good shape. And essentially, we just had to pay them to do it because otherwise it would not have been cost effective for them to do it. So then we're able to take these really cool beams, put them on our wood miser sawmill and turn them into beautiful mantles and siding and paneling and all kinds of cool things that are then available to the public instead of going to the landfill. So what if instead of, you know, you do the salvage and instead of demolishing the whole thing, you just change the use of it to what you wanted it to be? This is essentially adaptive reuse. It's kind of a fancy remodel, but it's really a little a step beyond that. It's it's changing the purpose of a building um, to whatever you need it to be, but not demolishing the entire structure. So today I'm going to talk about two different adaptive reuse projects that I think were really cool that were Tacoma based. Um, oh yes, adaptive reuse. That's what we're here to talk about. Uh, so let's start off with the Washington building. Uh, this is in downtown Tacoma. If you live in Tacoma, you have likely driven by it. It's on Pacific Avenue. It was built in 1925, 120,000 square feet, encompassing 18 floors. And at the time, it was the second tallest building uh, in the Pacific Northwest, second only to the Smith Tower in Seattle. So a company called Unico gave us a call and said, how would you like to salvage a historically designated uh, skyscraper in downtown Tacoma? And I almost dropped the phone. Obviously, the answer was yes, we would be happy to come out and take a look at this awesome project. Um, so there's a few cool features that I just kind of want to go through with this. And what's interesting about it is some of them are things we were salvaging and some of them were things that just stayed in the building so that they can be enjoyed for, you know, hopefully another hundred years. So if you see on your left side here, um, this marble entryway, uh, it's, a, it's a very grand entrance, um, beautiful Alaskan marble, sometimes called salt and pepper marble. Uh, there was a kind of an 80s remodel uh, that you might, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but these lights here clearly are not from 1925. And this god awful railing that's part shiny gold and part chrome is just was put in by people that at the time that must have been fashionable. Um, the other really cool thing is in the basement, they had a giant vault uh, from when it was the Scandinavian American Bank. And I'm going to show you guys a couple videos here in a minute, uh, hoping that they actually work through Zoom here, um, of us walking around in that building while we're doing the work. Uh, but first, I want to talk about two other really cool features. This building has a glass elevator shaft, um, meaning from the outside, you can actually see the elevators going up and down, and it's all made out of this old, really cool chicken wire glass. If you look at the picture on the left here, you can see that the glass is, or the, sorry, the chicken wire is really uneven. And that's actually because this stuff would have been twisted together by hand and then had the glass essentially poured over it. So you can really tell that it's the authentic you know, the original stuff. Um, they have chicken wire glass now that you'll typically see just is just crisscross, um, but you can definitely tell the chicken wire is the original stuff. And just a personal grievance. They've got, the elevators don't have windows in them. Missed opportunity. That'd be so cool if you're going up the elevator to be able to look out over Tacoma. That's just my opinion. And on the right-hand side, you can see some of the beautiful marble bathrooms, uh, which I will be showing you in the video in a second here. Um, so this video, um, disclaimer, I'm not a video production background at all, so it's a little janky, and I'm going to show you two videos. One was much more geared towards selling the materials that we salvage, because like I said, that's how we, you know, put food on the table. And then I also just went through and kind of took some of the outtakes of it. There's a little bit of overlap, but I put it together for this presentation because it shows some of the other stuff that we um, didn't salvage out of that building. And so let me see if I can get these to work for you.
Here we are in beautiful downtown Tacoma. You have to get through this sea of mop sinks to see the awesome marble we've been working on the last two days. Beautiful stuff. This is original to this 1925 building, and I think we got about 30 sheets. How freaking crazy is that? The vault. I thought it was my idea to have a bar in the vault down there. Chicken wire. You know, we're taking that urinal. Orchard ladder. Storage room. So much mahogany in here. Let's go on up. This is one of the more original floors. A lot of ugly paint, but like really cool textured glass. But these, we are gonna get every one of these out of the 18 floors. And then every single floor has these awesome bathrooms. This is from the good old days where when you were using the urinal, you had to have an enormous ashtray. <laughs> that door is just gorgeous. That door is amazing. But then they just they just could not help themselves with the ugly 70s wood paneling. It's like, oh, how, how, well, this is our secret door here. This building has a ton of these radiator covers. What would you do with your radiator covers, Kirsten? I would hang it on the wall and you can use it to put magnets, you can use it as a menu board, chore chart for kids. This is our brave and heroic crew taking a little break. Say hi to Facebook, everybody. Hi. <laughs> we always love to bust into the maintenance room where we found these porcelain mop sinks. That's it. Completely freed up. Okay, that's video number one. I hope that worked. Can somebody pop on and like give me a nod if that worked? Yeah. It, yes. it definitely worked and it was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, cool. There's a little bit of overlap in this one, but uh, I just thought it showed a little bit more of the stuff that the uh, the people, the Unico chose to keep. So here you go. So I'm going to take you guys inside and we're going to have a couple weeks here and it is a cool old building. There is a lot of stuff to see. A lot of the stuff is historically designated, so it is all going to stay, which and this is an original 1925 bathroom. How cool is this marble? We just removed a piece and it weighs a ton. Another really amazing piece here. They're keeping this. They're really cool. They're keeping it. And that's just fine with us. This is the lobby that is also going to stay intact, though we are going to get these cool glass sconces. And then it's just kind of a interesting to go through and see what the all, all the old tenants had going on. The, the kitchen is just full of typical kitchen stuff that we really like. I mean, you can't find this kind of racking at like Home Depot or something. That stuff is way strong and sturdy. This is the kind of things we bring to all of our jobs to move stuff around. And then another thing that's staying is this beautiful mahogany handrail. So this building is not going to be demolished. They are going to fix it up. I think they're turning into some high-end condos. And I'll show you upstairs. It is so cool. Beautiful views of the port and Rainier. It's going to be a little annoying to you guys because I'm going to show you a bunch of amazing stuff that we don't get. Like this. How freaking crazy is that? They talked about maybe turning this into some kind of like a 
like a bar, like a hangout area. <laughs> but yeah, how's this for a vault? As always, basements are just like... They're like, it's like the architects had like a hoarding problem and just left all this cool stuff. That's a giant welding table right there. And <laughs> I don't even know what to think about those. Another couple big safes. These are potentially salvageable, though someone took all the cool drawers. Um, it's just whether the, uh, whether the elevator has the weight capacity for these, because a lot of these were put in when this building was built. Let's continue on our tour. Chicken wire. We love chicken wire. That door will be coming with us. How weird is this? <laughs> what did that door open into? Just a wall there. I've already gotten lost in this basement like three times. I have to like yell to my buddies. <laughs> okay, this is so cool. Can I open it? Oh yeah! <laughs> and these rooms, I just get goosebumps in here. This awesome little guy's coming with us. You know we're taking that urinal. And all these racks here, we were just glancing at them and they're just full of door hardware. These bins, we are totally, we gotta get the freight elevator working and then these bins are all gonna come with us. They'll either be available for sale if we can't find a use for them. Orchard ladder, of course you need one of these in the basement. Property of Washington Building. Here's the breaker box. And they didn't label it, come on. Storage room, so much mahogany in here. And now we're back to the elevators. Oh, these are worth showing you too. These were, I guess, installed in 1960. How cool is that though? They're pretty commercial doors otherwise, but like that panel just makes it way cool. Let's go on up. Psych. We're not going up, sorry. That, that's actually the end of the video. <laughs> so I, I told you, I'm not, not much of a video production guy, but um, I have been having fun uh, putting these videos together. So uh, feel free to check out my other ones. I wanted to focus on Tacoma stuff for this, but there's a ton of stuff of all the salvages Earthwise goes on. So if I can get this full screen again. Um, so that is the Washington building. It was a really cool project. Um, and I, I would love to show you after pictures, but it's not done yet. It was, we just did this last summer. So they're still in the middle of, you know, probably a couple more years. So they actually get this um, ready for people to move into. Uh, the second project that I want to talk about is Stewart Middle School. This is a really cool project. This was, uh, like I was saying earlier, it was really early on for me at Earthwise, um, and it really just got me obsessed with this stuff. Um, but I was not doing a lot of photography or videos at the time. Um, so it was another cool thing about this particular one is at the, in the same season, I guess the same summer, uh, McCarver Middle School up on Hilltop was also being remodeled. And Second Use and uh, Earthwise both went toe-to-toe -to -toe bidding against both these projects, and we each got one of them. So Second Use did McCarver, McCarver Middle School, and we did Stewart Middle School, and it worked out really well because I don't think either of us could have taken on both projects. So us each having a huge school project to work on allowed us to both really do a good job of being really thorough in these projects. So Stewart Middle School, uh, 1924, um, it's one of these really cool projects, one of these cool schools that have amazing, super high quality materials that are just really like great shabby chic, great decor pieces. You know, these theater seats that you see on the left here are just so cool. They're so great to look at, but honestly, if you sit in them for more than five minutes, 
it makes your butt hurt. The idea of children sitting in these for an entire assembly or something just seems like cruel and unusual punishment to me. Um, but, you know, throwing them away also seems like a horrible thing. So that's where adaptive reuse is really cool because they bring us in, we take out all this really cool stuff, make it available to the public, and then they can put stuff that is much more appropriate for the school kids to, to have. Um, another great example is these slate chalkboards over here. They're so cool, and but they had asbestos on the back of them. And they, you know, when I think about what a, you know, how much a teacher has on their plate already, the idea of them having to like clean these and like bang together all the, you know, the erasers and stuff, like there's probably better use of their time. So uh, I think it's a really good thing for us to come remove them, make them available so people can use them in their homes and they don't go to the landfill. But also come up with something new for the um, for the kids to deal with. Um, and additionally, they uh, demolished the whole gym. Uh, that's the lockers you see on the left. And I was talking about beams and stuff. We're kind of wood nuts at, uh, at Earthwise. We were able to get all of the enormous beams out of the gym. And another shout out to another great demo company, uh, Dixon Company, was able to remove them with excellent precision, bring them out in a way that we could remill them into fantastic materials. And you guessed it, we just paid them to do it. Um, that's that's kind of the way you have to do it. And the there's really two facets to why it was profitable for uh, Dixon Company to give us those beans. One is we paid them for it. And two, you pay by the pound when you dump stuff. So us taking, you know, several tons of beams out of there actually saved them a lot of money. So that's kind of the way we get around, um, you know, the the disincentives to reuse is you just have to be ready to, uh, to fork it over to make sure this stuff doesn't end up in the landfill. And um, yeah, so I don't, like I said, I don't have great video from this one, but what I do have is something from the News Tribune. Um, and it was a little walkthrough they did of the new building to kind of show you uh, what, you know, why it's so important to remodel really old schools, save all the new stuff and put some cool, or sorry, save all the old stuff and put some cool new stuff in. So let's see if I can get this video going. <laughs> Came into Stewart, uh, obviously a historical building has its uh, attractions. However, it was getting it was getting a little long in the tooth, and so to go from um, just antiquated to about as 21st century as you can get uh, of open space, the, just the feel, the quality of air, the lighting, uh, the technology and access, the opportunity for kids to learn in different places, and we're gonna have a turf field. And turf field's fun to play on when it's rainy because you can slide around. So this is the Da Vinci Lab. Uh, we got about 2,000 square feet. We've lit it, run power everywhere we could. Uh, we have drying racks for wet projects. The floor can get wet. Uh, we even have checkerboard flooring for chess matches. We couldn't think of anything that couldn't be done in this space. You'll notice sitting in front of you whiteboard tabletops. You can write on them with a whiteboard marker, erase them as you go. Um, student note taking, one of the five high yield strategies we focus on here in Tacoma is that summarization and note taking. And so we can do it right here on the tabletops. Um, you'd be amazed that at a student who's not willing to write in a journal, if you tell them, just write on the table, they're all over it. But what I want to do is I want to come through here to the gym area. While we walk through this area, you'll notice that the recovered old gym floor is used all over the place. There's benches, there are the back of trophy cases. So this is the old gym floor. <laughs> Too often our schools, if you picture a sixth grader, I have taught sixth graders who were, I swear were like this tall, and I've taught sixth graders who I looked right, I looked at at their chin. And so, with these furniture, we really want to make sure that we have furniture that fits the needs of all of our students, and that was really one of the goals um, for here. Broadcasting with all the microphones. This rack was designed to hold power for all their lights, their audio. Uh, we actually have a studio quality table coming in, so if you watch Tacoma 4 or 
I mean, even the ESPN, right, you just have this nice natural table. We've been using a fold-out card table with a blanket over it for the last four years. So the kids are super excited. They've been in here the uh, last couple days setting up their equipment, as you can see. And then we come in, we have lab space for production of broadcast, and then computer lab space behind the windows there. It's the attention to details, pretty, pretty amazing. All the, the little things are what we're noticing. All the, the water bottle fillers in the gym that fill your bottle fast, and all the wood throughout, and all the color. We're yeah. excited about that. I like how they use a lot of the older materials from the old building to blend it back in with the new building. That's pretty cool. Um, compared to before, it's been incredibly different. All right, another video that ends rather abruptly, um, but I hope you guys get the picture there. Um, I just wanted to highlight this project because I think it's kind of the, you know, it's like the the highest best use for this building and, and the best use for our, you know, taxpayer dollars to fix up an old school like this um, while doing it in the right way by salvaging as they go. And then these kids just have this amazing place to learn. You know, it's not like this 1924 building would have been set up for a computer lab or a lot of the, you know, science equipment that we use. These days to, you know, uh, to give our, our children a chance to really do cool things with their lives. So I feel like this one kind of is like for generations to come, um, we'll be teaching kids amazing things that would have been a lot harder to do in the setting of the original 1924 school. Um, so most of the materials, like I said, are really, they're kind of high quality, really great materials that we salvaged, um, but they belong much more as a decor at this point, as kind of historical artifacts, than as something for the kids to continue learning from. Um, so that's most of my presentation there. Um, two projects, one public sector, one private sector, one making sure that, you know, really rich people have nice apartments to stay in and one making sure that kids have a really great uh, environment to learn in but both of which were ensuring that as little building materials were thrown into the landfill as possible and that is adaptive reuse thanks Great, right, thank you, Aaron. Do this now. How do I release you guys? Oh, here we go. Here we go. All right. Well, thank you so much. This this was really interesting. I loved um, both presentations. Tons of cool projects. The video was especially immersive. That was fun to be able to kind of like walk around with you. It sounds like you're posting a lot of that kind of stuff on social media, so you could. If people are interested in seeing more, um, you can follow along there, both um, Second Use and Earthwise. So we do have a few questions that have come in from our audience. Um, we'll go ahead and start with one that you kind of addressed a few times, it's, and it sounds like it might be kind of a case-by-case -case basis, but we have um, someone wondering about how your partnerships work. Um, and she asks, are materials donated to Second Use? And if so, are you a 501c3? and I assume this goes for Earthwise as well. Um, do you purchase the items from clients or does it depend on the situation? Either way, great example of green commerce. So um, why don't you start off, uh, Amanda, or I don't know if the situation is similar for both, both uh, uh, companies or, or if it literally just depends on every situation. Well, I'll talk on our situation and then Aaron, you can talk about how similar it is. Uh, we are a for-profit company, just like Earthwise, our um, salvage services and pickup services are always free. Um, so we are literally doing that work for the value and the materials that we get. Um, but we also have a drop-off lane at both of our stores. So people who have materials that they can fit in their vehicle, they can bring it on down and drop it off. Uh, when they drop it off, it's possible that they could get cash or store credit for those or they could uh, just donate it through Habitat for Humanity. So all the proceeds from that material would be given directly to Habitat for Humanity. It basically works like a consignment under Habitat. Yeah, and we're, we're pretty similar in that respect. Um, it is absolutely a case-by-case -case basis, um, but uh, we partner with Historic Seattle and Historic Tacoma, and essentially we will, um, if, if you will either be able to in the same way, 
pay for the materials directly, give store credit. We love giving store credit. A lot of times people that are into this kind of stuff um, really like to do store credit because they're going to find cool stuff that they can trade for whatever their next project is. Um, but we do partner with these nonprofits, much like Second Use does. So we're able to offer the tax donation receipts. And essentially the way it works is we make a contribution on your behalf and we're kind of the middleman there. So, you know, Historic Seattle really would like to have a big yard like Earthwise where they can salvage all this stuff but they don't really have the capacity we do have the capacity so essentially if you bring the stuff to us we make a contribution to them you get the tax donation receipt for it and i hope that's not too complicated but that's kind of how it works no, that, that actually was the, the next question was um if if folks get can get a tax credit for bringing in and so it sounds like because yes. you're donating to a nonprofit, um they can kind of Yep. And it, it, yeah, it works. It ends up working the exact same way as far as doing your taxes. You can write it off like anything else. There's a bunch of weird stuff I could get into. You get <laughs> you, you, if it's over five thousand dollars, you need an appraisal, and that's kind of like just like goodwill and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty simple. Great. Great. Yeah. Um. So actually, I, I I had kind of a follow up question that um from your presentation, um, you said that with the schools and and you. Or maybe, maybe it was both, but you bid on on the job. So is that a situation where you, I, I guess you put together a proposal? I mean, you're not bidding to like pay to go in and do the oh, work. Oh, yes, we are. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you actually are purchasing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, so there are situations maybe like um, some of these larger buildings where um, where you are able to kind of take enough material and take enough material with a high value or high resale value um, that you do actually kind of have to pay. Yes, and I think that's, that's a really important um, point to make because it is kind of a misconception. People sometimes are like, oh, you get all this stuff for free. Why are you charging us money for it? It's just... It it, we don't get it for free. I'd say 99% of the stuff in our shop um, we've paid for one way or another. And when we do a tax donation receipt for you, we're still paying the nonprofit for it. So we are we pretty much always one way or another. And at a bare minimum, we're paying the labor to go out and do the removal and stuff. So they're, yeah, just right. pointing out. As well as the rent to store it until somebody finds its forever home. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> exactly. There's, it's a lot of complicated kind of moving parts then of like um, balancing, you know, the, the cost of business and paying your employees and this saleability while also trying to make sure the products are reasonable because as you were mentioning, um, it, it's sometimes difficult to, to get that moved out. So um, we do have another question, and this was specific to the Washington Building Project, um, and it was kind of what uh, areas were historically designated on the interior, and and what kind of what could you salvage versus not salvage? I mean, maybe folks are interested if if there are public spaces in the building, they could go check out some of the historic stuff. Sure, sure. That's a great question. And I don't know all the ins and outs of it. I essentially went in with Unico and they said, you can't take that. You can't take that. You can't take that. Um, so I don't know how that works with the historical preservation if they specifically said, hey, the lobby has to stay intact, but you can do whatever you want with the floors above that. Um, that was kind of what I was gathering is that there was something, you know, Unico wasn't making these decisions on their own. They definitely had some kind of a, you know, we're not, the, I think I'm guessing they have to apply and go through some permitting process to do any work to a historically designated uh, building. And then there's certain areas, yeah, that we're just not allowed to touch. Um, and there's probably certain areas that they didn't want us to touch because it was just less screwing around for them to have, you know, you know, like, if we don't have to do anything here, we won't. Like, I don't know if that bank vault had to stay there, but I think we were all in agreement, it's better if it just stays there. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I actually um, I've got a little bit of an inside track since I am on the commission, um, kind of understanding this process a little bit. Um, so there's there most of the time for landmarks, it's the exterior that's protected, and that's kind of the thing that's providing the public benefit. Um, in some cases, you can have certain parts of interiors also protected. Oh. Um, typically, it's like like you were just saying, the lobby, like kind of these these public spaces, often entryways or large decorative lobbies. I don't believe this building was, the interior was 
specifically landmarked. Um, but it sounds like the owners were just interested in like keeping some of that historic feel on the interior um, in some specific places. Certainly that fault is very cool, very amazing. I think it's gonna add um, a lot of cool character. Um, so that makes perfect sense. Um, so it's it sounds like they're um, kind of trying to find a balance uh, between keeping some of the cool historic stuff, but also upgrading, making it comfortable um, for for their future tenants. Cool. Thank you for that. Uh, right. Um, got another question. Uh, how were, well, actually we have two related questions. Um, one is how are the asbestos backed blackboards at Stewart Middle School handled as far as abatement? Great that they were saved. And then we have someone asking about wood having lead-based paint, does that make it harder to resell? So, or reuse or resell? So how do you deal with those types of issues? Well, those are both very good questions because <laughs> we want to be very careful about hazardous materials. Um, I guess with lead paint, it is a really tough one because we mostly deal in old homes. So there is large, like it's very likely that underneath several layers of latex paint, there may be lead-based paint. Um, we typically, um, we actually offer a product where the um, exclusive provider of a product called Lead Out. And Lead Out is this really unique patented product that binds to the lead. It's a paint stripper that binds to the lead. So so that you can just flush it down the toilet or throw it in the trash can because it makes the lead completely inert. Um, as far as the asbestos on the back of the um the chalkboards, uh, we were fortunate enough that the asbestos removal company set all, basically, I, I'm guessing this is how it worked, but I don't know for sure because we just got there and they were removed for us, but the asbestos abatement company pulled it off the wall. I think the glue stayed on the wall and the, the asbestos containing glue stayed on the wall and the slate came off completely clean. So it was kind of a just a score for us. We just had completely clean slate and we just rolled it out in big carts and <laughs> got it on the sales floor. Oh, that, that worked out well. Yeah, asbestos is usually in like um, those types of materials like glue or insulation where it's like oh. one ingredient of another thing. It's not just like it was asbestos slathered on it. It was like, no, it's a part of, yes, yeah, these other materials. Amanda, did you have any thoughts or comments about some asbestos or lead issues that you've dealt with? Um, I don't have anything specific. It's, as Aaron said, it's just something that we have to be aware of anything that we think might have um anything that has large amounts isn't going to make it on our floor but things that have slight amounts uh, lead glass windows and things like that we make sure to mark it so people know okay so you actually um if 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 you're uh, sort of un, or if there is a little bit left you, you're you're just kind of letting the consumer know like you'll need to deal with some of this uh, potentially. I mean, and that's it's a little bit the cost of doing business with historic materials, whether it's salvage or working in a building um, that's that's still standing. So um, I think we've got, actually gotten through everyone's questions that I can see, um, unless, um, and I'll just kind of ping, I know Lauren was going to be uh, watching the Facebook, so um, I, it sounds like we didn't get any from there either. And we're like literally right on time, right at seven o'clock, so that is excellent very well timed presentation very well planned out questions from the audience excellent work everyone um but i just want to say thank you to you too because these were very cool projects and i know that um as a board member of historic tacoma we appreciate uh the donations you've given us and i have obviously friends and colleagues um at uh historic seattle as well we're all it's a pretty knit, niche uh tight tight group so we have folks uh pinging in the, the chat there, thanks as well. So I'll just go ahead and do one more shout out for Second Use and Earthwise social media accounts um, so that you all can follow along and see more cool videos. Um, and thanks of course to the City of Tacoma Historic Preservation Office for pulling this all together and setting up the panelists um, and to Historic Tacoma, uh, Tacoma Historical Society and Tacoma Creates for, for supporting um, for supporting the event. So thanks everyone. We'll go ahead and close it down um, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe out there. Thank, Thank you. you.